I was planning to present you a new project we developed with Luis Alva Valdivia from UNAM on secular variation and pleno intensity in Mexico during the Pleocotenary. But I just finished the analysis of an older data set and I thought this data set would be a perfect example for this meeting. So sorry to mix up the program, but I'm going to talk about Egyptian, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic paleomagnetic data set. And you see the subset is why it's so important to archive data at the measurement level. And there is still a long way to go. So if we look a little bit first to the lead news activity in Egypt, um, is there? Yeah. So here I'll show you the Cenozoic activity. The Cenozoic volcanism is uniformly basaltic and is widely distributed in the northern part of Egypt, where you see all these red spots. Uh, it's a little bit out of scale, but if I really put the size of the outcrop, you wouldn't have seen anything on the map. So I increase a little bit the outcrop. And you can see there is two, uh, two types of outcrop. In the Cairo area, you can find some very thick flow, very nice one, and with a very large extent, you can see all around this artificial lake with the flow. In most of the other places, you find outcrop like this, just a little bit of resort in the middle of the sand dune. So it's not that easy to find good outcrop in this condition. If we go to the Mesozoic activity, uh, it's a little more expensive than, uh, extensive than the Cenozoic one, but you find them mainly in the southern part of Egypt, here in the western desert, and on the other side in the eastern desert. And you have some absolutely gorgeous things in this part of Egypt. Unfortunately, the outcrops look like this. So you can see some small outcrops here, but you can follow the range like this, and all the results, and that's all the Abu Simbel and Toshki are there. A two phase of volcanism, well, of news activity, because it's not only volcanic, you have also uh, ring complexes and intrusion. In the late Jurassic, early uh, Cretaceous, and in the late Cretaceous, early tertiary. So, here is a sampling we have done, and I'm going to go pretty fast on this. Uh, we have five focality in the Cenozoic. Cenozoic is in blue on the map, so you have three flow in the bar this. Catraniaria, uh, Abu Yabel, Abu Ab, and Kutir, the direct sites. And in the Mesozoic, you have that is green, uh, what I show you, Abu Simbal and Toshki, Shalatin, Abu Shiat, I miss one, no, I guess I don't miss one. Orientation of the sample, sometimes we had to use a tripod to do some block orientation, and uh, the rest, it was just uh, dreaming. And you may think that it's not that many samples, but you have to remember that it's sometimes difficult to work in Egypt and you need to uh, protect you from the sun sometime. So this is just a summary of uh, the direction we find. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on the paleomagnetic analysis. It's a very classic paleomagnetic analysis with rock magnetic analysis to just to find out the type of mineral we have. It's mainly magnetite, plus or minus, uh, the content of titanium is changing. For the Cenozoic result, all the directions are reversed. You have very well grouped um, direction uh, for all of them, except maybe a little bit in Abuad. Cenozoic is like, uh, Mesozoic is slightly different. Toshki is very nice. Abu Simbel a lot more dispersed. Abu Shiat is a very special example where you can see that most of the data are on the, the actual field, but there is one pulling unit which is pulling different results. And Charlatan seems to be reverse with a dispersion. So it's something we'll see later what it could be. So clearly this rock has been influenced by some remagnetization and mainly related to either viscous or chemical process in the field, like in the case of Abu Shiat, or by lighting strike, and you will see later. The only thing which is a little special with this type of rock is we could estimate principal component uh, characteristic remanent magnetization only for 65% of the sample, which is fairly low for that type of rock. Usually we have a lot more. So remagnetization is really something which has to be looked at carefully. So here you have all the mean results from the study. Uh, I show you a few, well, I, I plot the results at the cooling unit level. Cooling unit, of course, uh, a lava flow is supposed to uh, cool down in almost instantaneously in the field. So 
And then you have here the mean duration per area. <coughs> so the question is, how do you average your data when you have uh, just a small number of cooling units like it is the case here? So basically what I have done is when the mean at the specimen level was within one degree of the mean at the single level, specimen level was chosen just because, uh, you know, with two or three, the Fisher statistic is pretty meaningless, and especially the alpha 95 is completely meaningless. Only the kappa can give you an idea of dispersion. So I prefer to stay at the specimen level. And that was done for Baria, Abu Zabel, Kaprani, Abuan, and also Toshki and Abu Suban in the Mesozoic. For Shalatin, the two mean values, which are, I don't see where I am. <laughs> ah, here we go. The, that is green, the dark green. You have the two values which are here, are too different to be average, so I keep both. And for Abu Shiat, I just keep all these values together, and this one is something different. Uh, you can see that the dispersion is mainly related to the fact that some of the alpha 95 are very large. If you remove uh, the large alpha 95, the mean is going to be the same. So it doesn't change the fact that it's really on the actual field. Okay, so what do you do when you get new results? You just want to compare with what the other one have been doing. So the first idea was to compare with South Africa Master Polar Wonder Pass. And I choose two of them, the Bess and Portillo 2002 and the Toshi Canal 2008. Uh, you have both paths on the path. The red is Bess and Cotillo, the other one is Toshik. You see that the difference is not that big, except maybe for Hardin and 40 million years here. So we compare this, and clearly, well, the Abu Shiat pole position here is really on the Clio Pleistocene portion of the curve. It's uh, what we were expecting. Toshki, Abu Sindel, and one of the Sheratin poles are reasonably in agreement with the pass and uh, with the action portion of the pass between 110 and 120 million years. The other Sheratin BGP, which is here, plot close from what we consider that the anomalous uh, Abu Shiat BGP, but they don't overlap the pass. And all synodic data are completely out of Okay, so it was kind of difficult to really do the interpretation of the data. So I difficult to see if it's local, regional, global significance. So I decided to go back and do a compilation of all data published for Egypt. Uh, if I go in the good direction. So here you have the, the distribution of all the Mesozoic and Cenozoic paleomagnetic data which have been published for Egypt, 30 publication between uh, 1973 and 2016. You see that you have a fairly good geographic distribution with the blue in the northern part, but also a little bit fun in the southern, and the red, which is, as said before, in the southern part of Egypt. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the temporal distribution of the data. Distribution is pretty good, you have data everywhere, but of course you have a very, very poor precision on a lot of the age. But you have to be careful, some of the age, the, its uh, precision is poor, but it's because it's mainly some of the volcanics. As long as they have not been dated, the only thing you can say is they are tertiary, they are Cretaceous, so you have some very uh, large error of them. So of course, it's really, and most of the age we have for the moment is rubidium strontium, so we really need some better age. And this is something which needs to be done in the future. Mm -hmm. So now it's all the VGPs which have been uh, published for Egypt. And I just put a limit, which is really a very large limit, because I just get rid of all the poles with an alpha 95, which was greater than 20. And you can see that you have, well, actually, you have uh, Four unit, four BGP, which have to be removed in the Cenozoic and two in the Mesozoic. Uh, and mm -hmm. when you look at the distribution, you clearly see that there is something different between the Cenozoic and the Mesozoic, but there is still a large overlap, and it's very difficult to redo any kind of analysis with this. And there is no obvious correlation between the BGP and the ages. So there is different reason which can explain this distribution of the data. It's of course, the dating uncertainties. 
because I've said that before and we are not going to really be able to do much here. There is a problem of remagnetization. There is a very important problem of intermediate component of magnetization, and I will show you later what I mean by that. And there is a problem of averaging of the data. So to try to go a little further, I want to do the compilation at the site level. So in order to be sure that what we are talking about, everybody is using sites in a different way. So for me, a site is a cooling unit for igneous rock, and it's a outcrop, but a small outcrop for sedimentary rocks. It's not a section, it's just a very localized mm -hmm. area. So starting from that, uh, I did the analysis. I, I want to show. No, so I, I want to show you first some of the problem we have with the analysis, and this one is the very good example of uh, the kind of the magnetization we have. So Sheraton dikes are the one which are right in the bottom here. Uh, it has been studied before by Niazan mm -hmm. and Mustafa in 2002, 39 cooling unit, and we went back to do the same thing. You may wonder why well, we have only two cooling units in this area, but it's a very simple reason. We get there at the end of the field work, the drill broke down, we had problem with the drivers, so that was the end of the field work, went back, and when I see the result, we didn't bother to go back. So what happened in this area is clearly you can see the direction of magnetization, which has been uh, calculated for all the different sites, flow, it's only for the unit here, and it's very dispersed, and you have all the characteristics of IRM acquired by lightning strike. You have a very sharp decrease of the magnetization, uh, with air magnetization, the direction, well, very uh, important component of magnetization, we can see after that. In this case, when we have a partial magnetization, with the direction going from the ARM to the CHRM. In our example, that's one of our samples, you can see that it's, very, it's possible to very nicely define the final component of magnetization. But this is the example of what I call you know, the problem of intermediate component of magnetization. With this type of diagram, it's very easy to just estimate a component at the end of the diagram, which is still influenced by the remagnetization. So it's really something which is very important in this case. And uh, it's a problem that we would have trouble to really get rid of. And as an example of a magnetization you find in this rock, it's in the case of the barrier oasis up there. In this case, we are back in the, in the Cenozoic. We have 18 sites of sediments and I don't know, and eight basaltic flow, um, four, five different studies which have been done in this area. And you can see that uh, when you plot all the, the data which have been published, there is a lot uh, of the dispersion again. But if you just limit your alpha 95 to 10, you will see that you can really see a difference between the basaltic um, mean direction and iron rod and sediments. So actually for this type of thing, just to take an alpha 95 below 10 is a good criteria to reduce the influence of mixed component of magnetization. And it's something we are going to apply to the rest of the data. Finally, we have one problem, which is not a simple problem. is the fact that some area like, especially the Cairo Suez area, has been extensively studied. When you look at 10 studies, 144 sites, 17 published BGP. And the BGP, and you see it has been uh, going on from 1976 to uh, actually our study. So when you look at the data, you have the volcanic rock on that side, you have the sediments on the other side. Volcanic rocks, same, a lot of dispersion, a lot of overlapping in the diagram. Even with alpha 95 uh, below 10, you can start seeing two groups of direction, but it's still very dispersed, and you really have to go to something which is very uh, lower, like alpha 95 below 5, to really see clearly that you have one group with a barrier, and one group with a Catherine Isabel, which are clearly different. So for the volcanics, we just consider these two poles with these two mean direction as we are involved for this group. For the sediments, you have the Eocene sediment in blue, the Oligocene, Oligo-Miocene sediment in uh, orange, 
and same, we just reduce the alternative fat. And there is a difference, but it's uh, still the overlapping is very, very large. Anyway, we start, we keep one direction for the oligomyosin and another for the eosin. And that's about the only thing we could do there. So, if we summarize everything we have for Egypt, uh, for the Cenozoic, you have a certain number, that's all the poles which were uh, calculated in this new analysis, only 10 reliable, reliable in question mark, because I'm not really convinced it's that reliable. But only 10 uh, Cenozoic poles, 9 if you consider the A95 below 10, corresponding to 154 sites. And uh, six of these DGP have been recalculated. You can see when they are recalculated, this one, you have more than one reference here. So if we look at the, at the evolution, you have the first one, the early myosin, double Caprani result, which are here. And um, the age is uh, fairly well defined. We don't have any sediments, but it's slightly different from all the oligomyosin sediments which are here and which fit nicely with the, the LOMAT result, which is given as tertiary, so we have no problem there. You have uh, then the group with the chiral sediment, which are eosine, in good agreement with the ABUAD basalt, which is also eosine. Unfortunately, it's also in good agreement with the El Nina basalt, which is supposed to be early myosine. Then we have this pole for Baria, which is a little further, and a last group, which is somewhere here, uh, with the, the GIF-KBR basalt, paleocene. This one is well dated also, but at the same place at some sediment from Quetaha, which are supposed to be early myosine. And you have the barrier sediment, which are here, uh, but with a very large alpha-95. I don't know if they are really, uh, well, it's better to forget about it. So you see, I just put back the curve from the master polar wonder pass. And you can see that the shift compared to South Africa is anyway confirmed. We don't know if it's really, uh, what is the explanation of this? Maybe related to the Red Sea, opening of the Red Sea of Gulf of Suez, but I doubt it's the only reason because the, the shift is very large. So it's something we will have to look closer later. For the Mesozoic, uh, we have 19 poles which have been defined here. Uh, only five BGP uh, had to be recalculated because in this case there is a lot less uh, overlapping, uh, re-sampling uh, of the same units. Um, you look at the data we have all together and there is still a large overlapping between the volcanic, uh, the igneous rock in green and um, the sediments in yellow. Uh, when you compare with uh, a master polar wonder pass, you see that the, there is a Decent agreement with the uh, volcanics, but absolutely uh, the sediments are very different. And actually, this difference between sediment and igneous is a real problem to really uh, be, to assess the reliability of this pole. So, is there a large problem? What is it? We don't know. And it can be uh, something a little more complex, like intermediate component of magnetization again. So if I conclude on this, uh, you have a large overlap between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic public BGP for Egypt. So we start with 30 publication and 658 sites. Um, the no fine analysis of the data set is possible with this. Three main reasons, dating uncertainty, remagnetization and intermediate component of magnetization and averaging of the data. To minimize the error and new compilation at site level, has been done, and we get down to 26 publications, 462 sites. 30% of the sample were already uh, just uh, removed. There is a, a little bit because we didn't get some of the, the older reprints, so if anybody has old reprints on Egypt, I'm very interested to get them. But there is also a, a lot of uh, um, study where we don't have the result even at the site level. So we defined 31 means uh, uh, out of 323 sites, 49% of the sample left. 
but we decided to check take only results coming from at least three sites with alpha 95 less than 10. We are down to 42% of the sample. And with this, we can say that the VGP described a coherent paleocene, myocene, apparent paranormal wonder pass for Egypt, significantly different from the South African polar wonder pass. But uh, for the Mesozoic, the agreement with the polar wonder pass is better, but the reliability of the Egyptian data is strongly reduced by the clear difference between results obtained from sedimentary and eclipse rock. And it's difficult to explain this difference just by, because of age. So final conclusion is that even after rejection of more than 60% of the determination on very basic criteria, we still wonder about the influence of mixed component of magnetization on our new mean. And the only way to solve this question will be to redo the analysis at the specimen level with homogenized criteria. However, despite a very regular publication rate in Egypt, you can see you have about five, six publications per period of 10 years. Not a single study has been arch archived at the measurement level yet. And I'm not you know, complaining about anybody because my paper is not inside also. But actually it's really such a waste of time, energy and money that a lot has to do to, be, to improve the situation. And I really think that something <laughs> It's one example of data set where we have this, but I'm sure that we can go back to a lot of uh, paleomagnetic data and we will have exactly the same problem. So, do you have any questions?
what we will know now, and I can uh, add this to the wish to Yeah, that's a very important thing. Also, um, sometimes you can't get back in to redo the space. So, anyway, because of political, you know, form. We're not asking the uh, trying to track down the samples and what are these samples that would be redone in a more sense, perhaps in a more sensitive way, rather than rather than churning through this uh, data that are previous quality. That's my point. It's not that easy. It's a lot easier to archive the data from these samples. And I can you know talk about the year in time to do that I was I was on the uh, with uh, that uh, in time. And one of the goals is to try to make it a repository only in every period of time, which is not a big country, so to get what I want at some point. And it's so difficult to do that. It's a huge amount of effort and work to do. I know it would be very important to do it, but it's not that easy. You know, the concern I have with, with, the, with the database running this way is that it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it enhances the profile of studies that should be. Once it's in the database, all these criteria apply to say good, bad, and different, and they get embedded in the literature. And I'm not sure if that's progress, as opposed to just saying, look, some studies we know about them in the published literature, they don't make sense, so let's redo them. Somebody has to say, otherwise, we spend all our time just going back and forth looking at uh, data that perhaps was misguided when they were originally said. How do you deal with that? I'm not sure I agree because you know, if you look at the, at the problem of IRS division, I guess the people were not aware of it. And it's very simple now with the criteria of the IRS to say, okay, this kind of information uh, is very secure, this kind of criteria is. I'm not sure people at that time knew to maybe uh, they would do something and differently. And the other way it came also that it seemed we didn't know before. And I will take more an example for Kevin Hank to take this day and his other direction to the direction to the end. But uh, you know, when we look at the way we are even the same identity now, uh, I'm old enough now to have seen two different three different schools. The first one was to say, okay, we take the first part of the school, the second one was to say, okay, we take the second part of the school. Now we say uh, no, we in between, you know, our understanding of this the physical process are changing. So for me, I want to really have such a, a huge amount of data to store. I think we need to put them. Put some notes if you want, but keep the it's it's our most precious archive. The, the, it, it might be at some time in the future very useful for the data sets to have uh, comment forms where people can discuss and reply on and leave notes and reply to notes. Mm -hmm. uh, on data sets where if you've spent you know many days or been out in the field or analyzed some study and have an idea of okay this is good or this is good uh, to be able to read those notes now. I know we haven't yeah. science scientists haven't been doing that, but I think that's sort of the future that we maybe that we can add to our our data and data system to have uh, and it's just part of not very many publishers, but publishers probably should do that. I think it's also. I think it's a very good point. I think it's should be that way to trace. But you know, when you think the time, the way to do this analysis is just to take the RNA scan once in a very long time. But if I went back to the field, get the sample, and do all the investigation again in the lab, we would have been more as well. And not for all the samples. So the, the time waste is really not at the same level. Maybe that's the most important thing of the database. That's a good question. Because it, it, there is there's no different thing in the database. It's just it's actually what the data is just more you can analyze and see what you do with the data. And to me, that's much more important than I mean if I would think about my own research, I would find uh, my own research is really busy. Uh, to such an extent that I don't really have time or time to time to go reinterpret data this whole time. I don't I don't think in the end that's the most valuable part of it. But being out there and being accessible so people can look at it and see what you did. Yeah, we do have this domain where we can access the results and we can see what you did. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and still <laughs> 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 and you can know the scriptures and hi, this is Dennis Kemp, I think this is a piece of crap or whatever. You can upload it in your own paper and say, I did this. I right. download the data and go through it and it all the ways. This is a couple of photos of all the data you supply, and then re upload it um, as a new publication. Associated with a new publication or a commentary, you just give it a PDF that you get a new And that would be a way of doing it if you have an existing system without the comment. How about superseding data? Yeah. How do you handle that? Right. It's a very good question. <laughs> We're discussing that. Yeah. Otherwise, you get it counted over and over again. And, uh, it's 90% the same marks. And, uh, yeah. 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 It's a really good way of helping the publication. Um, I, I 